I'm very old. Um, I use something in my classroom called an overhead projector. So this is a brand new concept for me to uh, use PowerPoint. I use this um, because the matrix had it right. We're nothing more than big batteries, right? All you biochemists and neuroscientists would like that. Nothing more than chemical uh, and electrical energy. Um, the matrix had it right, except we have all this social context around us that changes who we are. And this is the difficulty. When I put this presentation together and send it off the community, they go, hey, this is lovely, but there's nothing to do what we want to talk about. Your whole framework is incorrect. And I said, thanks. Um, and so I actually thought about what I was doing um, in my life and, uh, and said, it's nice to know that at this point in time I can be humbled still, which is a good thing for my ego. And so I started thinking about what exactly we do. So I took the step back and said, what have I done in my 30-year practice and academic career? What I realized is that, of course, we all have different lenses and different standpoints. And this is the issue in terms of trying to do research. Because, of course, there is virtually no research in the area we're talking about today. But this is part of the problem. It's very much a two-tail phenomenon. And where you stand, where you educate, what your uh, academic orientation has been will shape the way you ask your questions. And that's why um, I want to put this up to you to, to think about today where you come from and about the other perspectives. I was trained as a social worker, a background in biology and psychology, um, and then uh, was trained post-education, because when I went to school there's no addiction education anywhere, uh, in addiction. And so I went from being a mental health oriented person to very much an addiction oriented person. And so again, looking back, I mean, here is um, the question when it comes to families and peer support. What comes first? Is the addiction issue, right, the, the use of substance in excessive amounts, psychoactive substances, because we do define addiction incorrectly most of the time, or has the mental health issue occurred and in dealing with it, the individuals turn to drug use to counteract some of those symptoms? So what, what comes first in the interaction? Of course we know concurrent disorders are a huge element among individuals, but where did it start from? So then you have the second element of your conference here around parenting and child issues. And when I sent my original presentation off to the committee, um, they said, this is great, but it's all bottom up. It's all about kids. We're interested in about parents. And so you'll see, for my presentation, it's very much about the impact of parents' mental health and addiction issues on the children. Um, but I've been doing this research for the last 10 years, so I looked at what occurs to families when their child has an addiction or mental health issue, what the impact is on the way up. Uh, depending on where you come in the spectrum, right, because we have been historically quite siloed in our presentations. When I began the Addiction Research Foundation, which is now the Center of Addiction and Mental Health, I literally had to ask permission to talk to somebody across the street in the mental health division, because we were drug people and they were mental health people. We didn't talk to each other. And that's one of the silos that has been broken down. What occurs to you as a child, obviously, is huge. And you carry it forward as an adult. And so how many of the issues that you see in your networks are because of unresolved children issues? So this is, well, my presentation is going to talk about all these points. They've only given me 40 minutes, not the entire day. Um, I want you to think about which perspective do you bring and how can the research, the clinical work you're doing, take the opposite orientation. So this is it. I mean, here's the brain. We really are one people. And again, as a social worker, I deal with the notion of oppression and stigma greatly. And what probably upsets me more than anything else is the fact when you strip everything away, all we really are are these 10 billion neurons, right? That's what makes us who we are, our personality, our perspective, our orientation, and how those neurons work together. So the perspective that um, I take as a social worker is a biopsychosocial orientation for both addiction and mental health. And there's a reason we put the bio first. As a social worker, my responsibility, those of you who are clinical people, is that psychosocial. That's where we live and die in terms of working with our clients, enhancing and changing their environments. But the bio is crucial. And this, again, is that distinction between addiction and mental health. With mental health, unless it's an environmentally induced issue, I mean, the, the mental um, condition, the neurotransmitter levels, are predisposed, they're born, you have too much dopamine, you have too much serotonin, those exist. With an addiction issue, you're adding substances, right? You're changing your basic homeostatic state by adding substance. So we're looking at this notion is that when I look at the addiction piece, when I look at chronic mental health element, of course, is that intersection of the biopsychosocial. And so the difficulty with traditional research is we've looked at one simple slice at a time. And the beautiful thing about these networks is we're asking us from different disciplines to come together 
And look at that intersection. In my addiction field, I mean, relapse occurs for a variety of reasons, is that we don't deal with all three elements. Um, as counselors, we're not good at doing the biological piece. We sort of omit that element. And often, as individuals in medical health care, you put people back in the same environment because you're not trained to alter the social context of their lives. I did a wonderful training session several years ago with uh, people in the detox withdrawal management program out in Parkdale. And great sessions said, hey, you're wonderful. No wonder you won all these awards. You're fantastic. Except, of course, one third of our clients go back to live in cardboard boxes. So everything you've told us is irrelevant because I'll be back when it gets cold again. So this is in your lovely PowerPoint slides. I mean, this is in terms of family, right, and family theory. We work from, in social work, an ecological model. I believe in nursing, you also work from an ecological model. In your context, so we look all the way up from the interpersonal to the intrapersonal to interpersonal environmental and social structure, that biopsychosocial. And again, the question in terms of your clinical practice and your research network is which of these does it touch? I mean, obviously, we need to begin with the intrapersonal, but as you move to families, obviously, you've got multiple intrapersonals that then affect the interpersonal. Where's your family environment? Where does the context fit in? And when I was doing this, I had a student this year, I hope this is the next slide, oops. I had a student this year who brought me this, who brought me this in terms of their family system. So you need to think of a fourth year undergraduate student learning, and this is the family context that they provide for them as an introductory case. So I can't imagine clearing 20 cases like this. So we had um, partners who were in the grandparents who were in their 50s, who were um, the uh, biological and the step parent of the primary client, who was mother at age 28. This woman had engaged and had children with um, five different uh, men, and so we have a series of children. Those children have various issues of described ADHD, described acting out conduct disorder. And this is the beginning point. So in terms of an environmental context, in terms of examining where do I begin to provide this family peer support uh, in Lynn 2, in a rural context, I mean, where do you start as a 24-year-old brand new practitioner asking where to begin? Where to begin? And remember, this is a student's case. This isn't a seasoned 20 year practitioner. Uh, I have to go back since I screwed up my order. So, again, um, realizing that I was never trained in addictions in my academic education. I'm very interested in what drugs do, and again, that notion of the biological piece. You have mental health issues, you're born with substance use issues, um, you introduce these, and again, this is in your packages. And so, the key element of why do we have this intersection of mental health and addiction? Well, obviously, is that we take drugs for the first element, euphoria. It changes our central nervous system, it changes our brain, it changes who we are. This is our fascination with substance. And I talk about the fact that we don't have human culture, we have drug culture. Go back historically. I mean, if you still read a newspaper, I don't do the Twitter stuff. If you still read a newspaper, I dare you get to page five without seeing an article in everyday paper about substance use and the impact on society. In fact, in this lovely white book they're raffling off, so please do the, the activity, the lovely white book. In the preface, I took a week and I went to every continent, save Antarctica, different newspaper, different day of the week, and found an article dealing with addiction and its impact on the community. So it's a fundamental aspect. Our current prime minister is going to save us about $5 billion a year, I believe, when he brings in his legalization. And that's going to have a huge impact on families, right? Because in my day, the argument was smoking dope is bad for you, 1970s, right? And so the context has become now, it's safer and safer and safer. We've done a great job of educating people that tobacco is bad for you. Tobacco is awful, it does for your lungs. Except when you're inhaling cannabis, you're doing basically the same thing to your lungs, but we've lost that point. Crack isn't good for you either, just don't smoke anything. Um, and so here's your starting point. If you are homeostatic, if you are balanced, you take one of these substances and you go up and down the scale. You alter 
in terms of family education, in terms of young people education, most of it is you're going to die. And absolutely, both of the bottom of my end of my scale is death. And that's the problem many drug educators, or we're death educators. Because the average young person, the average person my age who grew up through the 70s and 80s and 90s knows that if you smoke a couple of joints, you're not going to die. That reefer madness is a fallacy. So if we're lying to you about cannabis, what else are we lying to you about psychoactive substances? So again, very distinct. I know addiction and mental health are put together. They should be put together. But there are very distinct processes in terms of what's happening to you biologically. I'm also a purist, right? I'm also a purist. And this is huge for health networks. I just include this very briefly for you, what is not an addiction. And I simply include this because for all of these, we need different treatment protocols, different treatment systems, different policies, and obviously different research questions. So eating disorders, those of you who work in this area, know that the primary resolution to addiction, you have harm reduction, and you have absence, absence being the older one. And we know with an eating disorder that if we give absence for 60 days, a problem will go away. Good, you got that. <laughs> I'm trying to think about, you know what, everything being an addiction, right? Shopping being an addiction, internet being an addiction. And again, substantive mental health issues but not an addiction. When you shop, when you use internet excessively, when you surf for pornography excessively, um, you don't have the same risk that you do with an addiction. I've never seen anyone have a seizure from spending too much time at Walmart. I truly haven't. <laughs> I don't need to take someone to a withdrawal management program because they have spent the time at the casino down the road making money and creating employment. Different protocols, different procedures. The issue is we lump things together is that we minimize the nature of the issue. And problem gambling obviously is a unique element as well too. So when addiction, we're changing the central nervous system, we're changing the autonomic nervous system, peripheral nervous system is being altered, or some of these compulsive behaviors, I find in fact your job much more difficult. In addiction, I know where to begin. I start with the drug use, I start with the antecedent event, very simple. But those of you who are doing mental health issues, much more complex. Because unless, again, they're trauma-induced, this is what a person's born with. Their homeostatic level from birth has been distinct. And again, those of you just very brief without addiction backgrounds, um, this is the process, right? Contact with the drug, right? Again, different from a mental health issue that's innate. Contact with the drug, you experiment or try or not try. Yeah. Integrated use, most of you have integrated use of alcohol. I'm assuming come next 14 months, some of you have integrated use of cannabis. I won't comment now. And then we have this point, and the students ask me, when do you become excessive use? And I talk about the biological and psychological social piece. I talk about all these elements. But what I talk about really is that turning point, is that when you no longer control the drug, but the drug controls you, the drug controls you, is that the vocational life, your spiritual life, your physical life, your social life starts drifting away and the drug becomes that central organizing principle of who you are. And of course you can stop, you can return to integrated use, there's whole treatment protocols around that. There's a stable state, you know, there's lots of people with stable states where they're not quite fully functional, but they exist in life and you know, they go to work and they have families and they have family disruption. And that homeostatic balance in the family, right, that what we would call dysfunctional becomes their functional state point. And then you move down to this thing called addiction. And again, lovely treatment options, some very good programs in Windsor, some nice programs in London. Stable state, this is gonna be a, a, an ongoing issue in the health networks as we create more and more people who are dependent upon methadone and suboxone. As we take people with opioid issues, and instead of moving them towards treatment, we decide that this is a drug of choice for you to continue for 10, 12, 14 years. We used to say six, eight weeks, so you can get off methadone. That's Caught in nothing but problems. But it's about two or three years to move someone to a lesser use. We now have people in this country who have been 12, 15, 20 years on methadone. Going to create a whole different set of health issues as they get older, a whole different set of family issues as they become parents. And you've got your 12 year old going, but mom, you use a drug every day, why can't I? That learning context about when we normalize drug use in our society. Progression of course, is to premature death, and the return is very controversial. There's an argument that once you have reached the state of addiction, that you can go back to integrated use, and I'll let the harm reduction seminar deal with that one down the road at some point in time. 
Um, I want to talk about the clinical piece in terms of something we don't talk enough about. A matching is critical is to make sure you have the right treatment for the right individual. As a client-centered profession, social worker very much asks, what does the client bring? What does the client bring? Very basic academic two-by-two two grid, nothing fancy here, is that when your client comes to you, right, and when you're researching the change process, how is the client, how is the individual, right, in the harm reduction movement, we don't talk about patients or clients anymore, we talk about individuals. How does the individual coming forward to you see how they came to your door? What extent do they see the problem? Is it something that they have brought upon themselves? It's something that they have participated in? Or do they have no idea how they got this point in time? And so there's two basic models in terms of how do we approach a client? Is someone that is actively aware of the process and steps they got here? Or someone has no idea how they went from having two drinks a day to having 24 drinks a day. That process is a blur to them. They have no insight. And those, again, require different approaches in terms of engagement. Because in the addiction field, and I can't speak to the mental health addiction field, we have a fantastic province-wide standardized assessment route. Research, wonderful, right? Totally unengaging for the client, for the individual, for the patient. As you come in and you spend an hour, an hour and a half at being asked a bunch of questions and forming no relationships, a therapeutic alliance. But great research. Well, well. And how do we help? How do we help? And again, different models. Does somebody really need to be taken by the hand? I mean, this is a, you have an ethics seminar, but this is a real ethical issue. Because as counselors, as clinicians, we've been told that it's all about client self-determination. It's about what the person needs, what they want, to make sure we're not intrusive in their lives. And for someone that has a high responsibility for solution, absolutely. I used to love working with teachers when I was um, still a real social worker. Because teachers loved homework, they loved cognitive behavioral stuff. It was really easy to get them to do things. But I have a couple of colleagues, um, some in northern Ontario, some in southern Ontario, who work in industrial settings. Well, and they literally will take an individual who they recognize in the workplace as having a problem, put them in their car, drive them to a treatment specialist, residential or outpatient, and bring them back home again. My professor would yell at me, I've broken every boundary violation in the world. And yet this is what they do in the real world because this is what the patient client individual needs, is they need someone to take them to their first AA meeting, their first Al-Anon meeting. I send all my fourth year students, social work students, to an AANA meeting and they are terrified. They have to write papers about it. So they tell me they're terrified. They tell me that they wouldn't go if I didn't make them go for 30% of their final grade. And so it's wonderful to have peer support networks, it's fantastic. But if you've never been somewhere and you have a low responsibility for the problem and a low responsibility, you can create all the networks you want to if you can't get people there. So obviously you have to have the networks first. But when we've got them, why don't people go? Well, I have baggage. My wife insists mine is more like unintended luggage. <laughs> so again, for a totally self-invested point in time, the only person that doesn't need counseling is a person who's not breathing any longer. I mean, our families make us dysfunctional. They truly do in trying to survive in this complex world. And right now, one of the biggest issues for young people yeah, I got one of these, one of the young people, right? And if you work in a university setting right now, if you work in a mental health patient, you know there's never been as much anxiety in the world as there is today. And so you see these things up here, these things called lights, right? These lights changed the universe about, uh, almost, not, quite, not quite 200 years ago. Because until that point in time, we lived in a moon-sun cycle. We had some torches, we had some Game of Thrones things going on, but basically, moon-sun cycle. Electricity came along and we changed. And our biology has not been able to keep up since. And so when I went to high school, my comparator group was the 800 people in my high school. My children's comparator group is the 7 billion people on the planet. You cannot, we cannot keep up with counseling services at our very small university. I know Western is saying sort of thing. They're overwhelmed with counseling services. We're going at university level, which is of course not part of the broader mental health network, we're going to single session counseling. We put social work students in the residences this year to compensate for some of the issues going on there. It is just overwhelming. We all come with our baggage. Thus, all families have problems, basic foundation. 
no such thing as normal, right? We all know that, we've all entrained that. No individual can force another to change. Personal change when responsible can be acknowledged. And so this is, I mean, that's a fundamental, that third point is a fundamental element of family work, right? Personal change can occur only when responsibly can be acknowledged. And yet my slide two slides ago said, some people need to be taken by the hand. And so here's our contemporary dilemma, is that knowing that the mental health population, let alone the addiction, let alone when you have a concurrent disorder, is extraordinarily heterogeneous. You're in a broad, 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 broad category of individuals. And therefore, we need multiple perspectives. And one again includes is that how much do we lead? How much of our counseling is dichotomous living? When you create that dichotomy in a person's mind, they think they're fine or they think they'll never get better. And how do we move them there? So it really is a challenge being a professor in school of social work and telling people, sometimes you take them by the hand and show them the options because they just aren't in a place where they comprehend it. First thing a psychoactive drug does is change who you are, changes your brain. All members of the family are involved. Huge, huge. My field, those of you who work are addiction specialists, know that the family didn't exist until about the year 2002. Didn't exist. People had problems and then they had families. The first paper written in Canada, first paper written in the States, I was very, very good with a guy called Farrell in 1986, but the first paper written in Canada about the need to have family involvement was written in 2002 by a guy named Cernick. You know what? And, it's really, and, and it really isn't that good, but, but no one else had written it. So I mean, it was me or nothing, right? And so I'm quoted all over the place. And it really is not that great a paper. It's probably a seven, but you know, what's first one? So I get a lot of citations. <laughs> so in the research network, why you're here today, what hasn't been asked? I mean, you think it's a simple question. Why aren't families involved? And certainly wasn't me. There's lots of people involved in it now. But when you look at it, there's more family involvement in addiction treatment. More, but certainly not enough. Removal of drug use is essential but incomplete. Is mental health a constant? And here's your two-tailed question. Addiction, mental health, concurrent disorder. And again, being trained in the addiction field, I can't tell what the mental health issue is until the drug use is gone, until that drug use is stabilized. Right? So really important questions to be asked that we really don't have answers to yet. A parent is always happy as her or his saddest child. I got two there in university, and every exam mark I live and die by, and I'm not even a helicopter parent. The one defended last Thursday. My birthday was Friday. I'm so happy with a good birthday present. He's going to be on the basement soon. He's graduating. <laughs> and he's got a job interview tomorrow, so that's good. Uh, this assumes healthy, functioning families, right? That's a huge assumption here. But in families where the parent has an addiction or mental health issue, it's not about the children. It's not about stable family parenting, right? It's about the fact that the parents need parenting. And so the whole notion of parentification of children is a huge issue for those who work in psychiatry and counseling. There's my family situation. Um, you'll see these points, there are a variety of elements, and again, uh, nothing new to you there in the notes you can go over to, but there are certain elements that create what we call balanced, homeostatic, functional families. And these are the elements that come under duress when a parent has an addiction or mental health issue, right? So again, will affect the children now and into the future. When I was doing employee assistance counseling, you know what, it was brief solution focused counseling, but the longer I did, the more Freud became relevant to me, is the fact that it's about family. It's about origin, it's about beginning. Not necessarily about the fact that oral fixations, but it's about that original beginnings. So those elements are all listed for you there in your handout. And of course, the problem as I see it is that you both are extremely adept at pushing each other's buttons, right? You get in a relationship, right? You get in a relationship. My partner and I have been together 32 years now. We had a dance when we fight. I know exactly what's happening. And she's fantastic with me now. It's just her and I in the house now. And she'll go, someone didn't put the dishes away properly in the dishwasher. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Guess I know who that someone is, and I go and take care of it. We don't fight, but she, I mean, we've got a little dance now, right? We've got a little dance that we figured out. So we don't pitch each other's buttons. We've had those fights. I want to just talk very briefly about the myth of families and mental health, right? And so this is the other piece. So we've talked about what happens, or at least listed in the notes what happens when the parents have an issue. 
The other one that many of you are concerned with in the committee's original orientation was about when the children have a mental health issue. And so there's a variety of myths that we have around mental health. And I guess a, a myth is a fanciful story, one that's told to ease our fears or, or scare us one or the other. And so I spent 10 years working in the field of homelessness. And of course, this is where the issues of intersection of mental health and addiction come very prominently and did some very um, important elements. And so the question is, how do these people end up on the streets? Where are their families? Why don't their parents care about them? Aren't they loving children? So I showed you the situation where the one mom had five partners and six children. There's a family in chaos. There's great likelihood that you will see some of those children in the next 10 years. Great likelihood. Because the child welfare system doesn't have the resources to support those six kids. There's already issues of acting up behavior, ADHD, already exist. And it comes, one child was born six months ago. These are the sort of things we heard about parents that weren't helicopter parents, but understood their children had needs. But because our current system allows for individuals to make their own independent decisions, other problems are created. I've moved my son 22 times in his lifetime. We always have to be ready for him to lose his housing. And so here's a different type of family stress and peer, right? Always waiting for the phone to ring, right? Always waiting for the phone to ring. I got two, two, I got two adults now, right? For both of them, I got the call, one o'clock. Hi, Dad, where are you, son? Just got my first ticket, I have to hear it, right? I mean, normal sort of thing happens to most parents who live in Hamilton. Um, but this family is waiting for the phone call, hi, I've been asked to leave again. And so their stress level is always elevated. Their own working lives, right, their own interpersonal lives are always elevated. They're always looking or always fearing that next phone call. And so, I mean, we, beautiful model, and if you want the theory, I can give you a beautiful model. But basically, in these families, where they're actively engaged in trying to support their adult children's mental health issues, their whole lives are about living with uncertainty. I did work with correctional officers for several years. And correctional officers are an interesting group because, of course, they're always trapped, they're always watching their backs, and they have raised levels of stress. They have one of the shortest life expectancy of non-agrarian workers in the country. And these families' mental health issues, very similar. Their stress level never comes down. It's always continually elevated. And as you know, there aren't support networks for this population. They don't have time for support networks, right? Because they're always waiting for the next phone call. Our issue is not just establishing networks, but making them important enough for people to access them. If you're worried about your child, do you have Tuesday and Thursday to go to a self-help meeting? Can I go 7 to 9 o'clock, right? Do I have these very narrow opportunities? How do we make these programs accessible for those in need? And just another quote, if you have schizophrenia and you're hearing voices and you're paranoid and there are people sleeping in the same room with you, it's just terrifying for my son. Because of this, he prefers to sleep on the street rather than go to a shelter. Right? And there's no doubt that our shelter system provides a needed service, but there's many limitations. And again, I'm old now, right? I'm old, and so when I started practicing, we still had things called psychiatric hospitals. Um, and again, not pro or con, but as we've seen the deinstitutionalization, we've also seen the increase of individuals' mental health and addiction issues in our criminal justice system. We've just changed the institution. That's all we've done over the last 25 years. And so here's the peer support network that I've asked. I mean, it's very well established. I mean, the addiction field didn't start with social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists. We had nothing to do with these people 80, 75, 80 years ago. They were icky and ugh, smelly and stuff. Ugh. And so they took care of themselves. I mean, the peer networks are started by themselves. Al-Anon, al AA, NA, all of the A's. They all started by peer networks. Changed the face of the 20th century. The self-help movement was one of the major social movements of the 20th century. But interestingly, AA is for the individuals, Alateen is for the, the children, Al-Anon is for the partners. There's no place where the family comes together. Everything is still distinct and again siloed. There's no place for the entire family, which is very well established. The Mental Health Community Peer Support Network, much newer. There, I know networks exist. I've worked with one in London. It's a very active network, uh, very different structure. But again, the peer support is for the active members. The notion of looking at the family as a goal, it doesn't exist. So I was asked, why doesn't your presentation have any research on this? I go, exactly. 
Exactly. Up until 2016, where when the only developed nations, along us and Mr. Trump's nation, um, with no formal family policy. You look at the European nations, you even look at Australia to a small extent, they've got family policy. We don't have, we've got child care benefits, but we don't have family policy. We have an integrated notion with family is important. 